This is section 127 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain, section 127, The Galaxy, February 1871, part 1. The Galaxy, February 1871. Memoranda by Mark Twain. The Coming Man. General Dewlap G. Lovell, Minister of Hong Wo, has resigned and returned to this country. His successor will not be appointed at present. Some of General Lovell's friends are nominating him for the vacant English mission. Item in all the papers. What a jar it gave me! For, as I am a true man, I thought it meant my old fellow-soldier in the Nevada militia, General Dunlap G. Lovell. And so I read it again, and again, and once more, and repeatedly, and with ever-augmenting astonishment. But at last I grew calmer, and began to scrutinize the internal evidences of this item. They were equal, part for, and part against, my level. For instance, my level, who always thought gunpowder tea was made from ordinary gunpowder boiled instead of burned, and will still think so until he sees this paragraph, is guileless enough to go on wearing a military title gained as brigadier in a militia which never saw service even in a Fourth of July procession, and consider it a distinction far from ridiculous. Consequently, this general is as likely to be as general as another's. But then the remaining point of evidence is against us, namely that this Minister Lovell has resigned. So it is not my Lovell after all, for my Lovell would not have resigned. No, my Lovell is a man who can always be relied upon, a man who would be faithful to the death. If entrusted with an office, he would cling to that office until it was abolished. I am acquainted with my Lovell. The distinct evidence is against my Lovell, and yet that lifting of a serene, unblinking gaze aloft to the awful sublimity of St. James, from the remote insignificance of the U.S. embassage to Hong Wo, with its candle-box for an official desk, and boiled beans three times a day for subsistence, and peanuts on Sunday for grandeur, is so precisely like my Lovell. But with sorrow I own that this General Lovell is Dewlap G, while mine is only Dunlap G. Consequently, they are not the same. Far from it. Yet it is possible that a kind word from me may attract attention and sympathy to my poor Lovell, and thus help a deserving man to fortune. So let me go on. General P. Edward O'Connor has done the highest and faithfulest and best military service in Mormondom that ever has been rendered there for our country. For about seven years or such a matter, he has made both Brigham and the Indians reasonably civil and polite. Well, however, I see by the papers that General O'Connor has not been appointed governor of Utah as the Pacific Coast desired. I cannot think how I came to wander off to General O'Connor, for he has nothing whatever to do with my General Lovell. Therefore I will drop him, and not digress again. I now resume. When the nation rose, years ago, Dunlap G. Lovell of Virginia, Nevada, Territory, flew to arms, and was created a Brigadier General of the Territorial Militia, and with his hand on his heart he swore an oath that he never would budge from his post till the enemy came. Colonel O'Connor flew to arms, and put down the Indians and the Mormons, and kept them down for years, and fought his gallant way up through bullets and blood to his brigadier generalship. But this is not a biography of General O'Connor. Hang General O'Connor! It is General Lovell I desire to speak of. General Lovell! How imposing he looked in his uniform! He was a very exceedingly microscopic operator in wildcat silver-mining stocks, and so he could not wear it every day, but then he was always ready when a firearm was to be buried or a relative hung. And he did look really beautiful. Any of the old citizens will say that. It was a fine sight when all the militia turned out at once. The territorial population was some twenty thousand then, and the territorial militia numbered one hundred and thirty-nine persons, including regimental officers, three major and eleven brigadier generals. General Lovell was the eleventh. 
I cannot now call to mind distinctly the several engagements General Lovell was in, but I remember the following, on account of their peculiar prominence. When Thompson Billings, the desperado, was captured, Lovell's brigade guarded the front door of the jail that night. It was well for Billings that he left by the back door, for it was always thought that if he had come out the front way he would have been shot. At the great sanitary ball in Carson City, General Lovell was present in his uniform. When the legislature met in 1863, General Lovell and brigade were promptly on duty, either to do honor to them or protect the public, I have forgotten which. He was present in his uniform with his men to guard the exit of the legislature of 1862, and let the members retire in peace with the surplus steel pens and stationery. This was the legislature that confirmed his appointment as brigadier-general. It also elected as enrolling clerk of its House of Representatives a militia chieftain by the name of Captain G. Murphy, who could not write. This was a misunderstanding, however, rather than a blunder, for the legislature of 1862 did not know it was necessary he should know how to write. When the governor delivered his farewell address, General Lovell and brigade were there, and never gave way an inch till it was done. General Lovell was in several other engagements, but I cannot call them to mind now. By and by the people began to feel that General Lovell's military services ought to be rewarded. So someone suggested that he run as an independent candidate for U.S. Senator, for Nevada was become a new-fledged state by this time. Modest as this old soldier was, backward as he was, naturally diffident as he was, he said he would do it, and he did. It was commonly reported and steadfastly believed by everybody that he spent the bulk of his fortune, which was fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, in putting up a legislative delegation from Virginia City which should fight under his senatorial banner. And yet that man was not elected! I not only state it, but I swear to it. Why, unless my memory has gone entirely crazy, that polluted legislature never even mentioned his name. What was an old public servant to do after such treatment? Shake the dust from his sandals, and leave the state to its self-invited decay and ruin. That was the course to pursue, and that was the only one he did pursue. He knew a land where worth is always recognized, a city where the nation's faithful vassal cannot know the cold hand of neglect. Washington. He went there in Andrew Johnson's time. He probably got Captain John Nye to use his influence for him. <laughs> what do we behold a grateful nation instantly do? We see it send General O'Connor—no, I mean General Lovell—to represent us as resident minister at Oriental Hong Wo. No, no, no. I have got it all wrong again. It is not my Dunlap, but somebody's do-lap that was sent. But might it not? No, it cannot be, and is not my Lovell, whose friends are pointing him towards August St. James. The first syllable of the name is so different but my Lovell would do very well indeed for that place. I am aware that he knows no French and is not certain of his English, but then our foreign representatives seldom know the language of diplomacy anyhow. I do not know that he has any education to speak of, am confident he has not. But cannot a man learn? I am not even certain that he knows enough to come in when it rains. Uh, but I say it again, and repeat, and reiterate it, cannot a man learn? We need a person at such a lordly court as the British who is well-bred and gentlemanly in his appearance and address, a man accustomed to the dignities and proprieties of the highest and best society. There is not a barkeeper, a desperado, an editor, or an Indian in Nevada but will speak in terms of respect of Dunlap G. Lovell, and say that he always worthily bore himself among the very cream of society in that critical and exacting community. We want no mere unconsidered mister at the court of St. James. We want a person with a title to his name, a general, nothing less. My general would answer. He could tell those old field marshals from India and Abyssinia something about soldier life which would be new to them, perhaps. But above all, 
we want a great-brained profound diplomatic genius at the court of st james a man surcharged with experience likewise now if this deep this bottomless hong wooian diplomat were only dunlap g lovell but no it is dewlap but my general would be a great card for us in england and i wish we could have him contemplate him in motley's place think of my dainty lilliputian standing in brobdingnag motley's shoes and peeping out smartly over the instep at the great powers it would be a thing to bless and honor a heedful providence for this consummation who are the friends who desire the appointment of that other lovell i wonder if that lovell were my lovell i should think the term friends referred to captain john nye of the lobby washington a man whom i love to call the wheels of government because if you could see him backing members up into corners by the buttonhole and influencing them in favor of this that and the other lovell whom the back settlements have cast up undigested you would believe as i do that our government could not proceed without him but sorrow to me this lovell is dewlap and mine is totally another man dunlap let it go i care not and yet my heart knows i would worship that president who should show my fading eyes and failing life the spectacle of general dunlap g lovell envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the court of st james and captain john nye of the lobby washington secretary of legation i would be content to die then entirely content and so with loving zeal i add my name to the list of general lovell's friends who are nominating him for the vacant english mission the galaxy february eighteen seventy one memoranda by mark twain a book review by r b w in his preface to this volume an inquiry into the origin development and transmission of the games of childhood in all ages and of every nation critical analytical and historical by thomas henry huxley l l d f r s author's edition new york shelton and brothers one volume twelve mo pages four ninety eight professor huxley says to the historiographer the most interesting period of research is that where history proper loses itself in the vague mist of mythologic shadow the childhood of nations has always been a favorite subject of investigation to separate the type from the fact the symbol from the thing symbolized the ideal from the real to regroup the disintegrated fragments and from the materials thus gathered to construct a firm and trustworthy superstructure on which the mind may rest in tranquil confidence this has ever been and ever will be one of the most fascinating pursuits to which the cultured intellect can be devoted if then we seek the childhood of nations as a favored field for philosophic speculation may we not with equal propriety turn to the semper existent nation of children seek out the origin of their traditions trace the development of their customs and interpret by the light of history and reason their orally transmitted lore herein is a new field for speculative research hence may be derived results the most far-reached prescience could not forecast and even childhood's games may thus attain an eminence in the realms of thought undreamt of by purblind metaphysicians of the dormant ages this extract shows sufficiently the spirit in which the author of vestiges of the creation has undertaken a work which to many might seem scarcely worthy the time and labor evidently bestowed upon it and the high position in the scientific world its author enjoys it is to be regretted that unfortunate domestic relations should ever affect the social status of a great and learned writer but this affords no just ground for disputing the logical results of the inductive system following out the idea of similarity between the childhood of nations and the nationality of childhood professor huxley says page seventy six disraeli in his amenities of literature 
has shown conclusively that the religion of druidism was one only possible to a people not yet emerged from a state of mental childhood the british druids constituted a sacred and secret society religious political literary and military in the rude mechanism of society in a state of pupilage the first elements of government however puerile were the levers to lift and sustain the barbaric mind invested with all privileges and immunities amid that transient omnipotence which man in his first feeble condition can confer the wild children of society crouched together before those illusions which superstition so easily forges whatever was taught was forbidden to be written and not only their doctrines and their sciences were veiled in sacred obscurity but the laws which they made and the traditions of their mythology were oral the druids were the common fathers of the british youth for they were their sole educators and for the most part progenitors could the parallel be more exact descending from the general to the particular consideration of this subject professor huxley traces objectively the origin of many of the childish games known in this country such as marbles ring-taw leapfrog etc and others which have been practiced from time immemorial by the youth of every clime and age speaking of the game of oats peas beans and barley o which is found to have originated in a mystic symbolism similar in some respects to the dances of the so-called shakers of to-day he says the allegory constantly presented in the religious chants of the aryans reveals a freshness which renders their interpretation easy it is sufficient to read the rig veda to be convinced that naturalism that is to say the study of physical nature constituted the foundation of the worship of those pastoral peoples who then occupied the punjab and later emigrated to the northerly plains of hindustan it is the direct product of that poetical and anthropomorphic spirit which personifies all objects all phenomena and is the unvarying form imagination takes at its awakening the lengthy extracts already made render it impossible even to allude to many of the most entertaining topics of this exhaustive work but one of the most curious of the traditions exhumed from the buried records of the past is that which relates to the game of hopscotch the professor traces clearly the practice of this pastime as far back as the invention of the morris and broadsword dances of the scottish clansmen in the early part of the eleventh century and suggests rather than positively ascribes its origin to the boyish imitation of their parents warlike sports by the youthful bruces and douglases of the period he gives however for what it is worth a quaint tradition which carries the origin of this game back almost to the garden of eden back in fact to cain and abel in person to economize space i leave out the tradition and also the arguments which the reviewer offers in support of its claims to probability editor's memoranda there is a superficial objection which may be made to the reception of this theory of the origin of hopscotch and it is obvious to have used these words cain and abel must have spoken english granted but the explanation is really very simple adam was an aryan the hebrews it will be remembered do not appear among the brotherhood of nations until the abrahamic era in this respect the mosaic cosmogony is fully sustained by sanskrit writers as well as by the chinese philosopher confucius who flourished three hundred and forty six years b c and necessarily cain and abel were aryans also now the roots of all languages are found in the aryan and semitic tongues professor huxley gives numerous instances most of which are well known to philologists of radical identity between words in use in several of the modern languages at the present day and those of the most primitive nations of the globe the reader familiar with the semitic languages will have no difficulty in following the author in his philological demonstration of the innate possibility that cain and abel may have given this name to this game 
that is that the sound and the idea intended were the same although it is unnecessary to say the spelling may have differed but this is a minor point the most interesting demonstration however is to be found in the algebraic formula by which professor huxley proves a similar conclusion it shall be our final extract but we cannot refrain from giving it entire in the professor's own words representing the two known qualities cain and abel by the letters c and a we proceed as follows let x equal the language used by cain and x the language used by abel also let y equal the language not used by cain and y the language not used by abel then close parenthesis equals x plus y or all the language used by cain and close parenthesis equals x plus y or all the language used by abel the time is assumed to be that at which the games was at its height then p plus p being the respective probabilities that any particular words were used we have c p x plus c p y equals c l and a p comma x plus a p comma y equals a l adding the two equations c p x plus a p comma x comma plus c p y plus a p comma y equals c l plus a l c p x plus a p comma x equals c l plus a l equals c p y equals a p comma y but since y equals zero we may omit the quantities containing that symbol and c p x plus a p comma x comma equals c l comma or c p x equals c l and c x equals c l period forward slash p a p comma x comma equals a l comma a x equals a l comma forward slash p but p equals one when x words are considered and p comma equals one when x words are considered therefore adding the two equations again we have c x equals a x comma equals c l plus a l thus proving that cain used x words and abel used x comma words q e d enough has been given we think to arouse the interest of our readers in this all things considered remarkable book it is enough to say in conclusion that the patient research and philosophical deductions of the student and the thinker have been here unearthed for the instruction and amusement of the present age a wealth of quaint and curious information which has long lain buried in oblivion or existed only among the anna of that pygmy nation which exists among us and around us but which until professor huxley became its historian and interpreter was not of us i wish to state that this review came to me from some philadelphia person entirely unknown to me but as i could make neither head nor tail of the thing i thought it must be good and therefore have published it i have heard of professor huxley before and knew that he was the author of watts hymns but i did not know before that he wrote vestiges of creation however let it pass i suppose he did since it is so stated i have not yet seen his new work about children and moreover i do not want to for all this reviewer thinks so much of it mr huxley is too handy with his slate pencil to suit me editor memoranda end of section one twenty seven